Hi, and welcome to the Brookdale Visiting Writer Series show. My name is Suzanne Parker. I'm part of the faculty here at Brookdale Community College, where I co-direct the creative writing program. Today, I'm very excited to be talking to the poet Fred Marchand. Fred is a well-published poet and a much-respected teacher of creative writing. He's the editor of the collection Another World Instead, the early poems of William Stafford, and also four collections of poetry, the most recent being The Looking House. Um, as well, he is a translator and translated, and I hope I'm going to get this right, he was, he was helping me, um, a collection called From a Corner of My Yard, which is a collection of a contemporary Vietnamese poets um, called Trang Dang Qua. Qua. Thank you very much. So welcome to the show, Fred. Well, it's a great pleasure to be here, it and is, thank you. It is, it is nice to have you here. Um, I wanted to say, in your, in your most recent book, The Looking House, in the beautiful last poem, First Song Again, it closes with the line, trust above all the imminent return of the small but persistent impulse to sing. And I just thought, is that what motivates you as a poet, to sing? Well, partly. It, um, I think the adjectives are important in that line, the small but persistent. Uh, there, there is an impulse to sing that sort of presence, mm -hmm. and it may not be, you know, a desire to sing arias, <laughs> right, or to belt it out in any way. But it is. But it's there. It's the same impulse, you know, how how songs will enter your mind, even commercial jingles, right, mm -hmm. will enter your mind, and you can't get them out, mm -hmm. and they're there, and and you even can walk down the street even without earbuds and start to sing them, not for anyone. Mm -hmm. you know, but yourself. Well, that impulse itself, that the way in which that's there, that seems to me part of what, um, what sparks poetry, mm -hmm. but also sparks, you know, reading poetry too. Mm -hmm. That there's somehow there's a, that, that, that's on a continuum, that, that little impulse that to sing is part of why I read poetry as well as write it as well. Great, great. It's the conversation that the writer has with the reader. True. As well. And the reader with the writer, too. I True. can't remember how many poets I've, I've read and been like, there have been times where I've been like, no, no, that poem shouldn't go there. Because it, it, it wasn't akin to the experience I had necessarily. It's just been funny. As, as you comment on it, I had another thought I should add to what you just asked me. That, you know, singing is one thing, you know, and then and I suppose I, uh, my inner life, I think I have singing at one end of a spectrum and narrative at another. Hmm. And I'm I'm so glad that actually that the poem the book ends on singing. Mm -hmm. um, there are narrative elements in that book, and but they're they're inflected and um, and 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 shifted, I think, by various singings that go on in relation to those narratives. Well, you do also. I mean, you kind of think of singing in all the different keys. Right. And the Looking House is such a rich book because yeah. it, it deals with so many themes of, of war and repercussions and loss and, and guilt, possibly as well. Mm -hmm. um, but framed through these these smaller stories and these larger stories. I was thinking about um, just on the on the back cover copy to this, um, but also often in critical responses to your work, people talk about. The, you know, the truth that they find there. Mm. Um, you know, Rosanna Warren wrote in it, these are true poems, tireless in finding ways to make truth feel true. And Ilya Kaminsky wrote, few American poets these days tell us the truth. I think inferring that you then are. Yeah. <laughs> and even James Carroll writes, the voice rings with truth. And it's just, there's a lot of commenting on the truth, the voice and the truth in your work. And I wonder if you, why you think that's happening. First of all, that you would ask this question in this way gives me chills. <laughs> and I will tell you why. Um, you're the first person who's asked me that question. Mm -hmm. uh, but you're not the first person who noticed the, this dimension of these, uh, of these blurbs. Mm -hmm. It was really shocking when they started coming in. And you know, through, the, through the mailbox, there were these announcements. And, and I, I turned to my wife and partner and I said, do I tell the truth? And, and, and she too had chills. And, and, and it was one of the ways in which I think, this is my interpretation mm -hmm. of, that, of this, it's one of the ways in which poetry does something beyond what you think you're doing. Mm -hmm. You know, that, that the part of the magic or the, 
or the um, the I don't know what the right word is, but the but the you know the, the really strange mystery of this mm -hmm. art is that because it's language and language passes through us at all levels of mind and and spirit, and we find ways to shape it, and it does things that, that draw upon energies that you hardly are aware mm -hmm. of at times, and so. Um, so when I read these, these really wonderful writers saying this about my work, I felt humbled. I said, oh, uh, that, if that's so, I'm really grateful. And I wasn't <laughs> taking credit for it. I was saying thank you, you know, for this. If that's so, thank you. Well, they do ring incredibly yeah. truthful, it's true. Although, part of me kind of thinks, wouldn't it be great if you kind of came out and said, oh, it's all a bucket of lies. Yeah, that's right. So, <laughs> well, you have to have a little bit of lightness and a little bit of subversion here, too, right? <laughs> yeah. You know, and I, I, have, I have loads of solemnity, and it's good to be a little bit sort of, you know, unsolemn and unceremonious at times. Well, actually, we're talking about The Looking House, and yeah. I always feel a little kind of odd asking a poet to, to, to answer this question, but... Heck, answer it. Ask it anyways. Could you describe the book to us? Sure. The, the title, actually, I, I, I'll begin by just describing how the title came to me. Great. Which is, again, another way in which that something um, unexpected happened. I had no idea that phrase was ever in my mind. Hmm. And, um, and I really don't know how the two words, obviously, the can come in any which way, but looking in how is why they should be put together, I don't know. I still, to this moment, don't know. I was, however, um, um, sitting in the lee of uh, a small ruined farm or shelter, really, mm -hmm. uh, on a hillside in, in Echo Island in Ireland, and a great storm was brewing. And... Um, and it was halfway up a mountain, mm -hmm. and actually the, these were cottages where um, seasonal migration of sheep herders in the 18th and 19th century it's all sounding occur. very poetic. I know. <laughs> so there, but it's raining like crazy, mm -hmm. you know, and, it's, and I'm freezing. And, and I'm, but it, I can't take my eyes off of this storm that's mm -hmm. shaping up out over um, uh, the, the ocean mm -hmm. and coming in. And, and so I, I sat and watched it come in, getting more and more soaked by the minute. <laughs> and I kept saying, well, this is my looking house, and I'm, and I'm yeah. sitting in my looking house. Wow. And as the phrase started to have some, um, you know, some capacity to stay with me, you know, like one of those songs, mm -hmm. um, it didn't make quote quite you know, rational sense, but I started to think that, that, that it had a metaphorical life far beyond the instant, that, there were, that my life was, you know, I could sort of look into many corners of my life and find looking houses. Mm. And, um, and so that's sort of how the poems, I didn't, I had written many yeah. of the poems by then, but they started to make sense to me and, and started to take, like magnetic filing started to take some kind mm. of shape that was hidden inside the work that I didn't quite know until that phrase came to until me. Until that came to be. And so how do I describe the book out of that? Well, the, these, are, these, are, these are places where in many, in great difficulties and, and you know, considerable hardship and suffering, we'll put it that way, in both the outer world and the inner life, mm -hmm. that, that there are places that give you know, some temporary shelter, not comfort, but some temporary shelter, and they give you the gift of being able to see what it is mm -hmm. that's soaking you or you know, worse. Mm -hmm. And uh, and so I felt that there that while there was um, you know a, not an exactly a clear rational sort of uh, uh, interpretation of mm -hmm. looking house that 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 what was given to me was a sense of how there were places you know spots yeah. of time if you will and places in which I could see things and I was I was I thought of them as looking houses. Well, there's the one poem that has and I'm gonna. Sure. You please correct me on this line because mm -hmm. I'm badly paraphrasing, but this idea of we will look back at these moments in time. Yeah, and, and you see, and the thing that I'm not sure I can paraphrase, um, <laughs> um, um, I think the thing is that, that, um, that one stands at times in places where, um, where again, it's not, you're not protected, but you are, in fact, gifted with a chance to get a glimpse of something. And they are gifts. And, mm -hmm. And so, consequently, I kind of felt that I um, that I had a sort of slight, you know, my Puritan self cut in. I had a, I had a slight responsibility to those gifts. Mm -hmm. I, I needed to do something, you know, with them and make make the, um, you know, make the gift meaningful, you know. Yeah, you deal with some dark themes in this mm. book, though. They're 
the, you, you deal with war, um, you deal with being a conscientious objector. Um, there definitely seems to be a process of forgiving the self, kind of coming to terms with society and culture. Um, you know, the journeys throughout these poems, and I know that you yourself have kind of described this as a as a dark collection. Do yeah. you think of this as a dark collection for you? Well, it's funny you should ask it that way. I do. I mean, mm -hmm. basically, I do. But, 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 the, but I do also think of, and I, I feel, you know, feel out on a limb when I say this about my own work. But I do think there are these these dimensions of, um, you know, of radiant possibility mm -hmm. that keep finding their way through all of the darkness, and so, um, so as. The darkest of the, the, I think of the the ending section of this book as as really the h hardest of the psychological poems that are in this book. Yes, yeah. and they become more personal. They become more internalized, and um, and then then at the end of a, a run of them, uh, uh, all of a sudden I introduce some small land animals, <laughs> and I and I and I love those animals. In fact, that was the last poem I wrote for this book. Oh, really? Yeah, and I and I love those animals for just the way in which they they, they creep in, and even in this, they seem to find ways of uh, of both being and mm -hmm. surviving. More than that, flourishing, mm -hmm. and it's that that sort of then sort of tumbles toward a couple of lyrics, one of which you just quoted at the very end, mm -hmm. where there's a sense of singing, even even if it's small, it is persistent and it does revive. Well, it's, it's a short poem, and I think we have time before break. Would you maybe share it with us? Sure. Be, I'd love to hear it. It'd be a pleasure. And it's, as I said, it's privilege. interesting after sort of this, this turbulent voyage that you go on, that you end up with these two poems that yeah. do lift you up at the end. This is First Song Again. That again part, I might add, is pretty important, you know. Mm -hmm. It's a little bit of a reminder that, okay, you have to start over again, you know. <laughs> but first song again. Trust all the wood you stand on. Become an ally of the grain. Bend in the wind. Trust even the high, precarious places, the steeples and windy overhangs that teach you everything. Trust, too, the rose tint of late afternoon sifting down through a lofted blue heron wing. Trust, above all, the imminent return of the small but persistent impulse to sing. It's just a beautiful poem. It, just, it, it gets me right here every time. And actually, I'm going to ask that we take a break. I'll sure. kind of try and get myself together. Um, <laughs> it is a gorgeous yeah. poem. Um, you're watching the Brookdale Visiting Writers Series. We're going to take a break. Please come back with us. We're talking with Fred Marchant. Oh, hey, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Brandon! Hello, my name is Max Weinberg and I'm a musician, but most importantly I'm a parent. To best understand the challenges that our children face every day, well, I'm going to ask you to go back in time and remember the challenges that you faced as a child. How did you know what the right choice was? Prevention First is a nonprofit agency in Monmouth County that offers educational programs dedicated to strengthening the foundation of our children's lives. Open a book, you can explore new lands, meet new friends, and discover new adventures. There are amazing possibilities when you open your mind to reading. You can log on to the Library of Congress website and let the journey begin. Hi, and welcome back to the Brookdale Visiting Writer Series show. My name is Suzanne Parker, and I'm talking today with the poet Fred Marchand. Right. Before the break, you read that beautiful poem to us, and I was kind of wondering, the, 
it is a, a somber, a turbulent collection. And then in the end, you do have these, these two short poems of, of lifting in them. And I wondered, was that intentional? Did you say, all right, I don't want to bum people out too much? Um, occasionally, that thought entered my <laughs> mind. Oh, but no, but I, I think, honestly, that I thought that, that, that as, as, um, as dark and, and really as... Um, helpless mm -hmm. as some of those poems become. The Looking House stanza, the signature poem of the mm -hmm. book, is really about that sense of not being able, you know, to alter um, or save uh, mm -hmm. anyone, you know, and what that actually feels like. And mm -hmm. and uh, and yet, it seems to me that there there are these ways in which one survives that, or one hopes mm -hmm. parts of oneself. Yeah. can survive, not always. There are ultimate ends and so forth. But I was thinking uh, about this question that you asked me a second ago, and, and remembering too that, that the, op the not the frontispiece poem, um, but the first poem inside the sections of this book, Ardnamara, so it is somewhat of a narrative, it's a woven narrative, mm -hmm. it's two or three time zones, so to speak, uh, woven together in reflection, but uh, but at the end, it fixes on um, a, a time when I lived in Ireland as when I had just gotten out of the military. And I was really so solitary. I was working on a farm, mm -hmm. and I didn't go anywhere. I just did my farm work, and I had a little um, loft in a barn to live in. And the light would come in at a very low angle late at night, you know, 9 or 9.30 mm -hmm. at night. And, and I, would, I remember going to bed early and looking at that light just slicing across the room mm. and loving it, but also yeah. somehow being shaken by it. Mm. And, um, and the poem ends with that. I mean, yeah. it, all I know, I had to trust that there was an important feeling dimension to that. That's all I could come up with. Um, well, in, in organizing this book, it is unusual to have a five-page poem to sort of start the book off. Mm -hmm. It was actually my editor's suggestion, Jeff really? Schatz. Yeah. Oh. He said, I had it in the middle. I had it like a mountain to climb. <laughs> and he, Jeff said no. He said he, he thought it might really work as an opening poem. And I said, why? And he said, well, he thought of it as a platform hmm. upon which the rest of the enactments of the book could occur. So. I'm still not quite sure what he means, but I had a sense, it sounds right, I think he's right. Mm -hmm. Then, then uh, James Carroll, when he read the manuscript, mm -hmm. he wrote one of the blurbs. I, I recounted this uh, advice from my editor, and he said, absolutely right. He said, mm -hmm. and, and I've never forgotten this, I think it's true, he said from his point of view, the book itself is a wondering about the nature of that light that cut across the room mm -hmm. way back when. And then, of course, repeated itself in a variety of ways in the 35 years yeah. since. And I'm still wondering about that. And, and indeed, um, that is, how I think, how the book ends. I'm wondering Which about that. That yeah. light again. Yeah. It's a beautiful, beautiful collection. Yeah. It's interesting that you're talking about the role your editor had. Yes. Because you have edited William Stafford's early poems, you know, taking what is an incredibly important American poet and, you know, have now brought out early poems I had not seen publication before, yes. and I'm wondering how that project came to be. It's, um, it came to be in part because, um, well, first of all, in, in the 1980s, uh, when Bill Stafford was alive and, and still teaching, um, I, I went to several workshops of his. Mm -hmm. I needed to work with him, and I could sense inside me. My, my deep sense of perfectionism, really crippling perfectionism, <laughs> despite my smiles, uh, um, um, he, he understood that how self-defeating that was, and, and he really understood about writing as a process. Mm -hmm. and, so I, and I was in my mid-30s, and I gravitated toward him, and, and we became friends. And uh, when he passed away in 1993, his son began a project um, of doing a selected poems for Grey mm -hmm. Wolf Press. Um, and that posthumous selected poems, the way it is, was done in collaboration with about 14 of Bill's closest friends, mm -hmm. not including me. I mean, I was just a student, you know, but really Robert Bly and so on and so mm -hmm. forth. And uh, 
But I was contracted by Grey Wolf to be the contact person for Kim uh -huh. Stafford as an editor. So when he got it together, then he and I went into a mm -hmm. conversation about them. I don't know how much editing work I did, you know, but I made mm -hmm. suggestions about things he had forgotten and so on and so forth. But we became friends in the process. And uh, about six or seven years later, um, he inquired if I'd be interested in writing a biography. Well, by that time, I was really thinking I was too old, actually. I really needed a younger person to do that. <laughs> Why and would he, that be? I'll tell you, because I needed to write my own poems. And I could, yeah. tell, I could hear Bill Stafford in the corner of my mind saying, you know, there are many good ways to avoid writing your own poems. And, <laughs> uh, this would be one of them. <laughs> And, um, but I said, I went to the archives to look at the materials to see whether or not I thought it was a doable project mm -hmm. by me. And I said, no, I don't think it is. I think your father's telling me I shouldn't do this. And mm -hmm. then I said, but I'd really love to write an essay about those poems that he wrote while he was a conscientious objector during World War II. Mm -hmm. And so with the help of the archivist, Paul Merchant, cousin Paul, if you will, mm -hmm. um, uh, I got together a, a Xerox of the entire first 10 or 15 years of, of the record of his mm -hmm. work. And about six months later, I really got to working on it and looking at it. And I realized that it was, what was there was more than an essay. There was so much unpublished or yeah. at least unavailable material. Around 400 poems, and out of them, I, in the first cut, I selected 150. Wow. And, um, and that number pretty much stayed the same, although the identities mm -hmm. changed over the next four years, five years. Um, 176 poems out of those first 400, 16 of which are in print somewhere, mm -hmm. you know, but 160 nowhere available. Mm. And so I felt like I was adding to the record, and especially yeah. around this question of conscientious objection. As you mentioned, I had been a CEO myself during, World, <laughs> during, <laughs> during the Vietnam War. But I'll tell you why I made that Freudian slip in a second. But during the Vietnam War, I was in the military, and I left as a CEO. You were one of the first Marines yes, to leave as a true. conscientious yeah, objector. I was the first and Marine officers ever. An honorable discharge, yeah. yeah. And... Um, I spent the, excuse me, the four or five years working on this material in the archives, you know, in the summer or visiting you know, during spring break or something like that, you know, when I could, and then mostly at home, yeah. but thinking constantly about what it meant for a man to be a conscientious objector during mm -hmm. World War II. The, the perennial question, the never-ending mm -hmm. question, the question, the eternal question of all CEOs, what about the Nazis, you know? Mm -hmm. And, uh, and so, so as I was writing the poems in The Looking House, so too I was doing this editing. Oh, I was wondering yes. about that, if these were exclusive projects or did one feed into the other? Uh, they were intended to be exclusive. Ah. And they, certainly the, the, the Stafford work fed into it. it. And I think maybe it, it helped me understand what I was doing uh -huh. with that material as mm -hmm. well. The, the essay, the, the introductory essay was a, a labor of love as well as the editing work, of course. The editing work was really serious archival editing. I was setting the record, you know, there mm -hmm. were variant readings and I had to learn, you know, the archival mm -hmm. methods by understanding, you know, well, how could you understand what was the, the one that was most, most authoritative. Mm -hmm. But I think that the, the, um, the influence, you know, the, the openness of, mm -hmm. uh, of Stafford's early work to the you know, to the difficulties he was, in, you know, dealing with. Mm -hmm. That helped me a great deal in writing these poems yeah. of mine. Um, mm. I have to say also, though, that, um, that, that, I, that I finished the Stafford Project a year, year and a half before I took um, the Looking House to its last, and I think really most important revision, very deep revision. Mm -hmm. I think I was preparing for that, mm. you know, for those three or four or five years uh, with the Stafford work. And then when I was, you know, in that book, was, you know, in, in process, being mm -hmm. ready to be printed. I was free to really go into my own work, which I, I had hoped was done, but, you know, as I looked at it, I could see it was still <laughs> stirring in there and it wasn't fully it wasn't realized. There yet. Yeah. Hmm. I had wondered if they really did, if they were feeding, because you, you can see the connection. Yeah. And of course, you b both were conscientious objectors, and there are poems about that. But it's funny, I was reading um, when Ron Slate reviewed um, the. 
the Stafford World instead, book. Yeah. Mm -hmm. He told the story about um, Stafford, and Ron Slate was an editor for a magazine. Do you know this story? Yes. And Stafford was sending him all these poems, and he would send him a packet of 12, and Slate would choose a couple to put in, and then when he brought him to read, he would say, you know, there's usually always a couple of standout poems. What are you sending all these poems to me for? It's pretty clear which, which ones stand out. And, and Stafford had, William Stafford responded by saying, um, if you had two kids and one of them had a club foot, would you love the crippled kid any less? <laughs> <laughs> Which is crazy. Do you find that, in that sense of generosity towards his own work? Um, and as you look at the work and you went through it, did you see a lot of evidence of that? Was there a lot of paring down for the anthology you had to do? Yes, there was. Um, what I saw were, were poems mm -hmm. that had different names or different mm. Um, different elements in them, but you can see that he was working on an aesthetic problem, mm -hmm. taking it through several poems. Yep. And when he when he got it right, you knew it. Mm -hmm. And the rest were sort of they were the he it was during that time he he learned the virtue and value of writing every day, and so he got up before his his civilian public service mm -hmm. wilderness work and began writing somewhere between 4.30 and 5 every day. Mm -hmm. And by the time breakfast at 7 occurred, he had something. Now, wasn't this work usually in parks or somewhere that was kind of middle of nowhere? They were in the wilderness, yeah. really. His, his, the camps, the first camp was in Arkansas, uh, Magnolia, Arkansas, a, a hard-bitten um, uh, farm area where they were doing mm -hmm. uh, soil conservation work. But then... Um, Three other years were spent in uh, various kind of wilderness camps mm -hmm. in the Sierras, um, and um, but what what was clear was that he he um, he understood intuitively that that mm -hmm. that the that the that the relationship with his work had to be nourished daily. Now, I, it's always a source of great guilt in my self guilt. <laughs> Are you up before everybody. every morning? Oh, God, no. <laughs> you know, and, I, and I wish that every day I wrote. Mm -hmm. um, but I also know that there are different kinds of rhythms, you mm -hmm. know, and, and I, I kind of like take the edge off of it myself by keeping words like nourishing the work every day, <laughs> you know, nourishing the relationship with the work, and so that there uh -huh. are days then. But still, at the core of that is that sense that if, you, if I could, if life were really good and I was right with the world, I'd be writing every day, at least a little bit, no matter what, as he did. And, um, but I, I think it's really terrific to see in this early work mm -hmm. how he worked out a, you know, a project. Mm -hmm. you know, here, he, would, he was puzzled by some things. I mean, I'll give you a really easy one. He experimented with indentation. I'm going to have to, we're, we're, running, yes, out we're time, running out of time, unfortunately, but we'll leave that we as, a, go as, a, as a cliffhanger. Right. Yeah. Go, go get the book <laughs> um, and read the wonderful essay that introduces the book. And again, it is called Another World Instead, the Early Poems of William Stafford, as well as The Looking House, which is Fred Marchant's newest collection of poetry. Um, Fred, it has been a joy speaking with you, and I wish Likewise. we only had more Thank time. You. And thank you very much, Suzanne. And thank you for watching the Brookdale Visiting Writer Series. Please watch again and check out info on creative writing at Brookdale at www.brookdalecc.edu. Thanks again.